the carnal womb that God sends people into this realm. Amen? Does everybody understand that? Women are blessed. They get to birth the things of God. Amen? Physically. But there's a birth in it is spiritually. Spiritual birth is explosive. It's a miracle in itself. And we're in a time and season and a new, a new era of great things. Literally great things. <laughs> and John 3. John chapter 3. Hallelujah. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful to worship the Lord? I'm telling you. There's that, like, instant change. As soon as you lift your hands to heaven, not half mass, you know. That means you're only half dead. Not one arm. Both arms, amen, you surrender. <laughs> Glory. You know, God brings us through so many things. When we realize the goodness of God, it's phenomenal. You know, we, we, we can't even comprehend of all the things that he rescued us from that we didn't even see. I mean, none of us should still be alive. We should all be dead. Every one of us should be in hell. Amen. But think about what his goodness has done. He is so good. And, 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 and not only is the goodness, his long suffering, his love for us. Man, he really puts up with us. My goodness. I say that a lot. I don't know how you put up with me. I can't even put up with me. My wife has a hard time putting up with me. <laughs> But he's so good, and sometimes we lose that sight. You know, it, there's nothing wrong of remembering where you came from, but don't stay there. Amen? That's how you stay in an attitude of gratitude. That's how you stay thankful. Of all the things that you and I have done in our lives and deserving of death, and he rescued us, that should keep us in an attitude of gratitude. And, and it keeps us from preventing and looking at what we don't have, and we thank God of what we do have. You know? Amazing. And John chapter 3 and verse 1. There was a man of a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with you. Now, there's something about, it wasn't just about the signs. Nicodemus was a part of the Sanhedrin club. And he came at night because he was afraid of losing his membership. Amen. And so he didn't want any of his other fellow brothers to know what he was doing. But there was something about Jesus not only by the works, but there was a, a love of compassion that he carried that was different. It was a love of compassion that he carried that was different. He didn't do things because he was under rule or under the law at that time. He did things because he loved humanity. He loved humanity. He loved the people. He loves us. It's a different love of the world. And so Nicodemus had this awakening moment <laughs> that there was something about Jesus. Seeing his compassion and his love that was not of this world. 
This love drew him to Christ secretly, again, in fear of losing his position, amen, or his membership. There was something about Jesus. And, and so when he went to Jesus, he said, look, I know that God's with you, but there's something different about you. And verse 3, and Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So Jesus changed the subject, or what you might even say, added on to the subject. Yes, I am from God. I am God. I'm not going to come out and tell you I'm God. But the, my works you've seen, you know that are from God. But there's something different about my works because they're done in compassion of love. But there's something that drew you to me, said Jesus. And he said to him, if you really want to be with me, you must be born again. So he went right to the point. Amen. He didn't beat around nothing. He went right to the point. He said, listen, Nicodemus, most assuredly I say to you, unless you are born again, you won't see the kingdom of God and the things that are of what you just saw now. And Nicodemus said, how can that be? Can a man be born when he's old? But Jesus had, was not talking about age. Can he enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Hmm. And Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So at first he said, you can't see it. And the second thing he said, look, you can't even enter it unless you are born of the Spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So everyone who is born of the Spirit. You know, really, nobody knows where wind comes from. It just comes. You know, people don't realize that we live and have our being in the presence of God. But most of the time, people are so concerned about how they feel that they lose sight of it. Everybody do this. Come on, move your hands. Do you feel something? Do you feel something? Okay, when you stop, do you still feel it? No. But is it still there? Yes, it's called God's presence. Hallelujah. So just because you don't feel something doesn't mean it's not there. That's where we don't rely on how we feel. Amen. <laughs> Nicodemus answered and said to Jesus, how can these things be? And Jesus answered and said to him, are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Come on, it's in the word. Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I had told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? See, they thought they were so spiritual because they knew about the letter and the law, but they put the letter and the law first and had no personal relationship. not saying that some of them didn't. No one, verse 13, no one has ascended to heaven but he who came down from heaven. That is the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so most must the Son of Man be what? Lifted up. In other words, Moses lifted up a serpent. God told him, to make a serpent and put it on a pole and lift it up and everybody that was bit by a serpent got healed. Jesus has now become the serpent for mankind. Everybody understand that? So anyone looking onto him or seeking him would seek healing. He said that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It doesn't mean he loved the world. He loved his creation, 
but he loved his people that are in the world. So he was not a lover of the world because his love is not of the world. His love is out of this world. Amen? It says in verse 17, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. That's why when many people are involved in the drug world, they're out at night. Because light, they hate sunlight. Unless they're passed out on the beach. Verse 21. Been there. Woke up red as the could be. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. Again, there was an awakening. It was an awakening moment for Nicodemus. And again, it wasn't because of just the works, but it was because of the compassion, compassionate love that Christ had. And again, Nicodemus was concerned about losing his position, so he snuck out at night to go see him. And he realized that there was a different style of this doctrine that Jesus was speaking about. It was different. There wasn't law. It was love. You see, the Bible is a testimony of all truth, of love and warning. Nicodemus was given a love warning. Everyone say love warning. See, in this love, it's living outside a violent earth. L-O-V-E. Living outside a violent earth, because earth is violent. So we're no longer living in this violent earth. We're living outside of it. See, God's love is not in the earth. It's outside of the earth. His love is eternal. It's different. So when you are born of the Spirit, you are receiving a love that's not of the earth anymore. You're receiving a love that's out of the earth. In 1 John chapter 2. In verse 15. Love warnings. Is everybody there? Let's speak it. Do not love the world. Again, it's not about loving the material of the world, just the material things of the world. It's loving the, do not love the agenda of the world, do not love the ways of the world, do not love the corruption of the world, and do not love, love the lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, and pride of life of the world. Because the world's love is lust. Amen? Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world... The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, there it is. It's in the world. It's called love. That's what they call love. Lust of the flesh, lust of the uh, uh, eyes, and lust and pride of life. They call love. That is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in all of its lusts. False love. For he who does the will of God abides forever. So without the love, eternal love, of God Almighty, you can't do His will. Because you're always doing your own will because you love yourself. You actually lust over yourself. Is everybody okay? Little children, it is the last hour and you have heard that the Antichrist is coming. Even now many Antichrists have come. Now an Antichrist is a lover of the world and a hater of God. Because it hates God's love. It carries no love. Even Satan's kingdom, they have no love for one another. They hate one another. Everything they do is to get position to rule over one another. 
They don't care. And, and it says again, little children, it is the last hour, and you have heard that the Antichrist is coming. Even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest, that none of them were of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. Again, he's talking about the love of of the world compared to the love of eternal. Amen? And, and again, this is an agenda love of the world. The agenda love of the world is promoted by lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, and pride of life. It is an abomination to God. See, we've got to get an understanding that the love of the world is an abomination to God Almighty. And anyone who's involved in the love of the world will perish. But God's love says, I desire no one to perish. Amen? He's given a love warning again. The Bible is full of love warnings. What does it do? The lust of the world prevents an individual from doing the will of God. Jesus was manifested the true love that he would empower us through the anointing so we could do the will of God. In 1 John chapter 4. Hallelujah. In verse 1, 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved. Verse 1. Is everybody there? Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits where they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. They're all now in CNN and NSNBC and all these places. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus has come into the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist which we have heard was coming and is now already in the world. Now, you will run into many people that will confess that Jesus Christ is coming to the flesh. But they're still not of God. Because they lie. Does everybody understand that? There are many Christians out there that are not going to make it home. Because they're not following the plan to escape. They claim that Jesus Christ is coming to the world, but they say to confess it. But the Lord says, many come to me. And worship me with their tongues and their hands, but not with their heart. See, there's a difference. It's a love warning. In verse 4, he said, You are of God, little children, and you have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. I mean, the love of God in you is greater than the love of the world. They are of the world. There they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. That's why you see everybody bound in all of this fear, all these masks and gloves and all this other foolishness. It's incredible to me that they're still doing it. Verse 6. We are of God. He, he who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know that this, there's a spirit of truth and a spirit of error, which is known as the spirit of deception. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of, is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. It's the love of God, not the love of the world. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. That, mean, that word might means you got to cooperate. Amen? In this love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be a propitiation for our sins. Blood of God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, 
and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we, are, we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. Now again, the anointing, the Holy Spirit is the carrier of the anointing. He's the eternal presence, truth, and power. Amen? So he's carrying the love of God. He is the love of God. When you are filled with the Spirit of God, the first thing you sense is God's love. Whoever confesses that Jesus... Oh, in verse 14. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as a Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God... God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have the boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in God's love. There is no fear in God's love. That's why you see all these people bound by fear. Because they're not walking in God's love. The enemy has come and brought fear, which has nullified the mind of Christ. Power. And they're now taken captive. They are bound in fear. They have been taken captive. They are prisoners of the love of the world. And don't even know it. Claiming to be Christians, they're prisoners of the world. We love him because he first loved us. Now, verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts what? Out all fear. Because fear involves what? Torment. Are these people tormented? Yes. Get away. I'm telling you. Like I said, I'm going to go around and pull those masks. You know. There is no fear in love. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. But he who fears has not been made perfect in the love of God. We love him because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he's not seen? And this is a commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother. Hallelujah. Many, again, many confess but don't follow because they have not given up or exchanged the lust of the ways of the world for the eternal love of God. Again, this, is, this love is living outside a violent earth. Love of God overcomes the lust of the world. Why? Because the love of the world is a controlling factor by fear and torment. Remember, Satan's greatest weapon is deception and his power is fear. Amen. God's power is love. It's called the anointing. Without abiding in his love, the letters of his word and living in his word, which provides and feeds off of, in other words, we feed our spirit with God's word, You can't do God's will. It's impossible. See, there's people out there trying to do the will of God in the flesh. And it's not going to account for nothing. Nothing at all. They're out feeding. They're out clothing. They're out doing all kinds of stuff in the flesh because they're doing it, believing God sent them because the Bible says so. But they're not being led by the Spirit. That's where you and I got to be careful because there are so many familiar spirits out there that try to mislead us to do God's work, not sent by God. These are all love warnings. Amen? Ezekiel 33. Everybody okay? Everybody there. Ezekiel 33. Sounds like a football signal. <laughs> the 
Ezekiel 33, 1 through 16. Hike. <laughs> Hallelujah. Really, the Bible's a playbook. <laughs> Secret plays Jesus has. Only revealed by those, by the Spirit to interpret what the next play is. Amen. Verse 1, again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, speak to the children of your people and say to them, When I bring the sword upon the land and the people of the land, take a man from their territory and make him your watchman. In other words, certain areas. He's saying, look at sword means judgment. Plagues, anything to that degree that can come. He says, look at make sure you set someone over to watch. Watch. Why? Because they're supposed to be watchmen or watch women to release a warning. These people are called to release God's love warnings. Amen? Everyone in this room is called to release God's love warning. Hallelujah. Verse 3, when he sees the sword coming upon the land, if he blows the trumpet and warns the people, that doesn't mean you're going to carry a horn with you. Your trumpet is now your mouth. Then whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, if the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be on his own head. Are there warnings going out now? Everywhere. Everywhere. YouTube, Twitter, everywhere. Google, Warnings going out everywhere. Churches, everywhere. Warnings are going to, these are God's love warnings to people. Why? Because the sword is here. What's it come to do? Cut off evil. It's come to cut off what? Evil. It says, he heard the sound of the trumpet, but did not take warning. His blood shall be upon himself. But he who takes warning will save his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet, and the people are not warned, the sword comes and takes away any person from among them. He is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood I will require on the watchman's hand. In other words, we are responsible to warn. Amen? I don't care if it's a loved one. I don't care who it is. You're to warn them whether they're in order or out of order. Warn them. I tell people all the time. I get calls from people all the time. They tell me certain things and whatever. Hey, man, you know, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? I think you need to give the girl up. I think you need to give the guy up. Why? Because you're living in sin. If that's what you want, get married. Do things right before God. You need to come out of the bars. You need, I mean, I get calls all the time from people asking questions of things about what's going on. I'll answer some of their questions, and I'll warn them. I'll give them a love warning. Do you want to stay caught up in the world, or do you want to make it home? You claim to be a Christian, but you're still in the lust of the world. I love Jesus. I want to show him. Verse 7. So you son of man, I've made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore you shall hear a word from my mouth and warn them for me. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. Therefore, you, O son of man, say to the house of Israel, thus says, if any tra of our transgressions and our sins lie upon us, we pine away in them. How can we then live? So say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Did you, everybody see that? God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He hates the wickedness, but he has no pleasure in the death. He wants them to turn and get rescued. Amen. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? Therefore you, 
O son of man, say to the children of your people, the righteousness of the righteous man shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. See, so many people think, I've been a good person for so long. And they break covenant with God, they think they're okay. No. You break covenant with God, hell opens up to you. As for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall because of it in the day that he turns from his wickedness, nor shall the righteous be able to live because of his righteousness in the day that he sins. So our righteousness will not save you. Only he does. When I say to the righteous that he shall surely live, but he trusts in his own righteousness and commits iniquity, none of his righteous works shall be remembered. In other words, they will be removed from all the treasures of heaven. Everything you stored up, once you break covenant, is gone. It's empty. But because of the iniquity that he has committed, he shall die. Again, when I say to the wicked, you shall surely die. If he turns from his sin and does what is lawful and right, if the wicked restores the pledge, vows, if he restores the vow, gives back what he has stolen, fulfills what he said he was going to do, hello? Does everybody understand that? And walks in the statutes of life without committing iniquity, he shall surely live and he shall not die. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood. None of his sins which he has committed shall be remembered against him. He has done what is lawful and right. He shall surely live. He shall surely live. But yet the children of your people say the way of the Lord is not fair, but, is, but it is their way which is not fair. When the righteous turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, he shall die because of it. But when the wicked turns from his wickedness and does what is lawful and right, he shall live because of it. Yet you say the way of the Lord is not fair, O house of Israel. I will judge every one of you according to his own ways. And it came to pass in the twelfth year and so forth and whatever. But we don't need to go there. Again, does everybody understand these are love warnings? God is always trying to warn us because he loves us. He desires the wicked not to perish. But he will cut them off. He gives everybody an opportunity to repent. To turn from their wicked ways. Love warnings to turn back to the true love and creator Jesus the Christ. God the Father. Again, we are not only restrainers of evil, but we are <laughs> watchmen and watchmen. In. Amen? We are to decree a love warning to people. Why? Because you should have a desire that no one perish also. We should have a desire for the lost. Leviticus 20. Oh, happy days. Leviticus 20 and verse 1. Love warnings. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying again, you shall say to the children of Israel, whoever of children of Israel or of the strangers who dwell in Israel who gives any of his descendants to Moloch. Moloch is the false deity of abortion. He's the promoter. That's what you saw when they run their children through the fire and so forth. They offer it to Moloch he shall surely be put to death. This is what God says. If you do this, you'll die. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. And I will set my face against that man 
and I will cut him off from his people because he has given some of his descendants to Moloch to defile my sanctuary and profane my holy name. And if the people of the land should in any way hide their eyes from the man when he gives some of his descendants to Moloch and they do not kill him, then I will set my face against that man and against his family and I will cut him off from his people and all who prostitute themselves with him to commit harlotry with Moloch. That's why we're to be coming against abortion. Now again, I understand that before many people have been born again, that they've had abortions. But thank God for the blood. You repent and you move on. Amen? Those children are waiting for you when you get home. Verse 6. And the person who turns to mediums and familiar spirits to prostitute himself with them, I will set my face against that person and cut him off from his people. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. And you shall keep my statutes and perform them, for I am the Lord who does what? Who sanctifies. Wow. Wow. Again, abortion and offering, many people are running their children through the fire and so forth. And offering up, they're doing it today. They're doing it today. You know, there's so much that's going on that people don't realize. Um, you know, many individuals are seeking answers from mediums and sorcerers and fortune cookies and horoscopes and everything else except for God. It brings a curse on you. When that curse comes, you can be guaranteed that your prayers will not be answered. You know, in the Old Testament, there's instant judgment. Today it's delayed. Today it's delayed. But judgment still awaits. God is hoping that the person will turn from their wicked ways to get things right. Amen? We see today that in the area where the, the, uh, the high-ranking demonic forces there are human servants of Satan. They maintain their positions by bloodshed. It must be human bloodshed, not animal bloodshed. They do animal bloodshed in the areas of witchcraft. But to maintain their positions, it must be human bloodshed. So in this, when you think about all of the people that are on the streets, addicted, that are overdosing every single day, those are being offered to Satan. Because they're providing the drugs and all the other stuff, lower level, as an offering to sacrifice when they commit suicide, when they overdose. Those are offerings that they have to maintain their positions. There's all levels of positions in the demonic realm. And they battle for a position. They try to kill more people to get a higher rank level. You think the Twin Towers came down by mistake? That was an offering. You think war is a mistake? Those are offerings. They create the wars. They create the chaos. When God in the Old Testament used to send out to war against they were warned against the giants. They were destroying their tribes, bringing them down. Because they were hybrids. Half human, half angel, angelic. And then they had their offsprings. And their hearts were constantly evil and wicked. God would send out his military to destroy them. Today, Satan's kingdom and elites cause the chaos to create money flow. Everything is about who has the property, possessions, and money. So they put their people in politics to change the course. They put them as become professors and teachers and scientists and, and infiltrating every level possible, judges and whatever. They hold seats and positions of authority. They own businesses where they're billionaires and trillionaires to keep the flow of blood 
sacrifice, and the flow of money. Because if there's no flow of blood, there's no flow of money. See, this is where we got to begin to see these things all the way through. And God in His great, great love will accept any one of them that turns to Him. No matter what they've done. He'll accept any one of them. Because His love is not of this world. Amen? That's why we give love warnings. Hallelujah. Deuteronomy 30. Deuteronomy 30. I desire no one to go to hell except for the spirits I send there. Because they're from hell anyways, you know. We hate the wickedness. We hate wicked deeds. We hate the wicked agenda. We hate the violence. We're to hate evil. Amen? But anyone that's willing to turn to compassion of Christ will always stretch out his hand. In Deuteronomy 30, verse 11, for this commandment, is everybody there? Which I command you today is not too mysterious for you, nor is it too far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend into heaven for us and to bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it. Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart that you may what? Do it. See, I've set before you today life and good, death and evil. And that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments, his statutes and his judgments, that you may live and multiply. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. See, we are always taking land. Even when you're praying in the Spirit, you're taking territory. You're taking atmosphere. You're taking territory in places. You're taking territory in your homes. You're taking territory in your neighborhoods. Verse 17. But if your heart turns away so that you do not hear and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, is alcohol another god? Yes. Any drugs, pornography, all of these things. There are other gods. And serve them. Verse 18. I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over to the Jordan to go in and possess. I call heaven and earth as a witness today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. That you may love the Lord your God and that you may obey his voice. I'm going to say it again. That you may love the Lord your God and obey his voice. The problem is you may make sure it's his voice. And that you may cling to him. For he is your life and the length of your days. And that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and give them. So we see that there's life and blessings, death and curse, that he who turns away from God will perish. It's a love warning. Now we know that the wages of sin is death, isn't it? But because you commit a sin, doesn't mean you're going to die right then and there. Not all the time, anyways. Remember, judgment is delayed. Judgment is an area where we are in judgment all the time, but God's wrath is delayed, I should say. So his wrath, your perish, your death is delayed because of wickedness or sin. And to hope that you get into a place where you won't perish. 
God is merciful. He delays as long as he can until you finally turn away and do whatever you want to do. There's a period of time. And let me tell you, most of the time you know that God's grace has been lifted from you. You'll know it. And the fear of death will come on you. Because you know what? You're battling now the spirit of death trying to take you out. I know it. I've been there. Second Chronicles 7. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 12. Is everybody okay? Love warnings. In verse 12, Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and I have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up heaven and there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people, that's called the sword of God. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I'll forgive their sin and heal their land. So God already told him, look at you know, this is going to happen. Just make sure that everybody turns. Now my eyes will be open and my ears will attentive to the prayer made in this place. For now I have chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever. And my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. As for you, if you walk before me as your father David walked and do according to all that I have commanded you, and if you keep my statutes and my judgments, then I will establish the throne of your kingdom as I have coveted with your father David, saying, you shall not fail to have a man as a ruler in Israel. But if you turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments, which I have set before you, and go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will uproot them from my land, which I have given them. And this house, which I have sanctified for my name, I will cast out of my sight. And I will make it a proverb and a byword among the peoples. Now we know Solomon blew it and lost everything. Amen? He blew it. He began to build altars and everything for his wives and began to serve and worship other gods. It was a love warning from God Almighty about the house. Now I want you to know that the Lord says that his footstool is the earth. So in God's eyes, he's now preparing, he's calling the earth his house. He's turning it over to become his house. Does everybody understand that? That's why the sword of the Lord is coming through all over. But what's it doing? It's cutting off wickedness, convicting righteousness, those who are compromising, and turning their hearts towards him in every way possible. Because he's getting ready to pour out his anointing in a greater way. He's getting ready for the greatest harvest that has ever been. Things are getting ready to happen. In Psalm 24. Psalm 24. Love warnings. In verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. He has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord and who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Who has not lifted up his soul or his desire to an idol. Nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. 
This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him and who seek his faith. He just said, the earth is the Lord's. I'm telling you, God is turning this earth over to become his house. Right now, we are the house of God, the body. Eventually, it will become the earth. In Ezra, chapter 9. Ezra chapter 9. Verse 5. Ezra 9, 5. It says, at the evening sacrifice, I arose from fasting and having torn my garment and my robe. I fell on my knees and spread out my hands to the Lord my God. And I said, my God, I am too ashamed and humiliated to lift up my face to you. My God, for our iniquities have risen higher than our heads and our guilt has grown up, grown up to heaven. Since the days of our fathers to this day, we have been very guilty and for our iniquities, we, our kings and our priests, have been delivered into the hand of the kings of the lands to the sword, to captivity, to plunder, and to humiliation as it is this day. And now for a little while, grace has been shown from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape. Everyone say, I'm the remnant. And to give us a peg in the holy place that our God may enlighten our eyes and give us a measure of what? Revival in our bondage. For we were slaves, yet our God did not forsake us in our bondage, but he extended mercy to us in the sight of the kings of Persia to revive us, to repair the house of our God, and to rebuild its ruins and give us a wall in Judah and Jerusalem. And now our God... What shall we say after this? For we have forsaken your commandments, which you commanded by your servants the prophets, saying the land which you are entering to possess is an unclean land. With the uncleanness of the peoples of the lands, with their abominations which have filled it from one end to the other with their impurity. Now therefore do not give your daughters as wives for their sons, nor take their daughters to your sons, and never seek their peace or prosperity, that you may be strong and eat the good of the land and leave it as an inheritance to your children forever. Hmm. And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great guilt, since you are our God, have punished us less than our iniquity desire deserves, and given us such deliverance as this. Should we again break your commandments and join in marriage with the people, committing these abominations? In other words, he's talking about do not un be unevenly yoked. Amen. At that time was separation of tribes. Now it's no longer about the tribes. It's about those who are righteous and those who are wicked. Those who, so he's saying do not be unevenly yoked. Amen. Come out from among them. And should we again break your commandments and join our marriage with people committing our, these abominations? Should you not be angry with us until you had consumed us so that there would be no remnant or survivor? O oh Lord God of Israel, you are righteous, for we are left as a remnant as it is this day. We are before you in our guilt, though no one can stand before you because of this. Now again, we are the remnant of revival. We were once out there a, a, a children of wrath. Amen. We were servants of darkness. We were servants of evil and wickedness, offsprings of Satan's kingdom. And God has shown his mercy and grace to us. And in this time and in this season, we are right now the remnant to rebuild God's house on earth as it is in heaven. Does everybody get it? We are preparing the way of the return of the Lord. In every area. We are to drive out demonic forces, not invite them in. 
We are the remnant brought forth for revival to drive out evil and establish the kingdom of righteousness. 2 Peter 3. Chapter 3. Love warnings. Again, it's amazing to me how many so-called Christians proclaim that Jesus came in the flesh and they, they're a Christian and they love Jesus, but yet they don't read the Word. They don't believe the Word. I don't believe the Bible. It's amazing to me. If you don't believe the Bible, you're not a Christian. You obviously not are born of the Spirit. In verse uh, 8. Hallelujah, is everybody there? 2 Peter 3, 8. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness will what? Will dwell. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot and blameless, that's that bride, and consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation is also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, which he has written to you, as also in his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the Scripture." You, therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware. Beware what? Lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and to him be glory both now and forever and ever. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Here the pages turning on a Sunday morning. Training for raining. You realize that you're loading up. You're getting loaded. You're, 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 you're getting the bullets. You're getting the grenades. You're getting everything. So that we can go to war. Glory. Second Thessalonians two five. Everybody there? Let's speak it together. Do you not remember that when I was still with you I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. That's us. Amen? We are the restrainers until we're taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will eventually consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Is he doing that now? Yes. And with all unrighteous deception, is that happening now? Yes. Among those who perish. Because they did not receive the love of the truth. They did not receive the love warning. 
that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion because they rejected the love warning that they should believe in the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Wow. Now that is phenomenal. Amen? It's phenomenal. They believe Because they took pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for what? Salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. Now listen to this. He chose you for salvation. But there is something, he says, that is going to maintain it. Sanctification. And the following of the Word of God. The truth. So he's saying, look at you've been granted salvation, but you got to be sanctified. He just says it right here. For you've been chosen for salvation through what? sanctification by the Spirit, by le being led by the Spirit in the presence of Him and being filled with the Spirit, and belief in the truth to follow the truth, to which He called you by our gospel for obtaining the glory of the attainment of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. So again, salvation is available to everyone. But he's saying, look at without sanctification, being filled with the Spirit and follow, you will lose it. This was a love warning. Because they rejected the law of warning. He said, I'm going to allow you to fall under the great delusion that will come. Second, or Second Corinthians 3. And then one more scripture. Second Corinthians 3. How many people are rejecting the love warning out there? Many of our own family members. <laughs> I think I'll carry a big magic marker, and everyone that has a mask on put a mustache on it. <laughs> It won't be a Z for Zorro, it'll be a mustache. <laughs> Hallelujah. Verse 7. Let's speak it. But if the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones, was glorious so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away. How will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? This ministry of the Spirit comes out of your mouth. Amen? It is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It's the ministry of the anointing now. It's the ministry of righteousness. But if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which was Going away, passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. Unlike Moses who put a bag over his head, I mean, uh, put a veil over his face, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of, of what was fate passing away. But their minds were blinded. Is that happening today? Until uh, Their minds were blinded for even until this day that same mask remains on their face. Unlifted in reading the Old Testament. Because of the, ma or the veil <laughs> that is taken away in Christ. I'm telling you, it's a time of unmasking. Amen? 
<laughs> Nevertheless, when one takes the mask off and turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Hallelujah. When one turns to the Lord, they're going to remove that mask and those gloves. And they're going to lose themselves from fear. And a sound mind's going to come back and go, man, well, how stupid could I have been? How deceived. I've accepted the lie. Watching the prophets of Baal on CNN, NSNBC, and, and all the other ones. Not willing to accept what God says. Not willing to stand on the word, calling themselves a Christian. And loving the ways of the world and stuff and loving God. Oh, but now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. Not bondage. Not fear. Amen? But we all with unveiled faces, in other words, we've taken off the mask, beholding as in the mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as the Spirit of the Lord. Now again, we are in the ministry of the Spirit in righteousness. As epistles, ambassadors, and stewards, and ministers, witnesses of the truth and God's love, we are God's sending out his love warnings to many people. To expose the Antichrist dictators that have now taken seats and positions of authority. They hold these seats of authority that are against righteousness and justice. They are holding individuals with needless lockdowns now. Closed businesses. Stop the flow of money but they get their own money. They are promoting death. See, because even so many people that have been plagued, if they keep them in the house, more people get sick. They've suspended the constitutional rights and your civil rights. They're using fear to control and deception to mislead. I want to give you a couple statistics today. Since February 1st, 66,000 people died from pneumonia. 740,000 people died from all of everything. There's been 740,000 deaths in this country. All kinds of deaths. 40,000 people died from influenza flu. 38,500 supposedly died from the coronavirus. The problem is that they have statistics that 7,000 people a month have died from influenza flu. That's what this, from the flu, the normal flu, that's what it averages. 7,000 people a month die from the flu. But now, since the coronavirus has come, now they're only recording 1,500 people dying from the flu. How can that be changed? Because they've taken what they call influenza flu and calling it corona flu to build up their statistics, get more money. Does everybody understand this? I mean, this is such corruption, it's incredible. But God's got a plan. You know, even in California, that Newsom governor or whatever he is, do you know that he's the nephew of Pelosi? It's incredible to me. There is an organization called the Daily Ledger you can get the truth from. And there's a news company called One American News Network you can get the truth from. I just want you to know. Because even Fox has got these morons that come on. They've been compromised. I believe Fox got balled out by Walt Disney or something. Now they become cartoons. I'm telling you, we are on a time right now that is so critical. I see a lot of goofies come on Netflix. It's really incredible of what's going on. But we must be alert. We must be ready. And we must be ready to release a love warning. Amen? Don't cuddle it. Release it wherever you go. This is God's final love warnings that will be poured out consistently. But, you know, everything is going to turn around, like I already shared with you. We're going to hit a prosperity this country's never known about. It's going to go global. The body of Christ is going to invade everywhere. There's going to be a such harvest. And everything will be prepared. Remember, God is preparing for him to come. 
He's, you know, remember, he, he, he came as a sacrifice. He's going to come to take his bride away as a loving husband. But when we return, he's coming as a king. To kick butt. So right now, the body is now the kick butter. We are here. He is the head. We are the body. We're to be doing his work, but be led by his spirit or his mind, his thoughts, his will, and his desires. And don't get sucked up in all of this stupidity. I can't believe how many people have become stupid who are so smart. Smart people become stupid because of the deception of evil. Amen? Let's stand up for the truth, and let's be prepared to give a love warning to whoever needs it. Amen? Is everybody okay? One more scripture. Psalm 16. Do you think you're going to go away with that? <laughs> oh, happy days. Aren't you glad you know the truth? Psalm 16, glory. Let's confess it. Let's decree it because we are the ministry of the Spirit. Preserve me, O God, for in you I would put my trust. O my soul, you have said to the Lord, you are my Lord. My goodness is nothing apart from you. As for the saints who are on the earth, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. Their sorrow shall be multiplied who hasten after another God. Their drink offerings of blood I will not offer, nor take up their names on my lips. O Lord, you are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You maintain my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My heart also instructs me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in hell, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. For you will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. And at your right hand are pleasures forever, evermore. Oh, prepare your hearts for communion. Let this word be sealed, protected by the blood and by the Spirit so it grows and bears fruits for His glory that it penetrate every part of our being, be stored in memory and brought forth up as quick as possible when needed. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen.